Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to uh, session four. Uh, this is a session on money, finance, and sustainable prosperity. Uh, very brief introductions. Um, please refer to the program and online for the full bios. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the first uh, speaker, Robert Hockett, um, who is a research fellow at the uh, Binzager Institute for Sustainable Prosperity and the Edward Cornell Endowed Professor of Law at um, Cornell University. He works in the field of organizational financial uh, and monetary law and economics. Um, he will be talking to us about finance without financiers. Is this working? Can you all hear me? All right. So um, I hope you'll forgive me for sitting down, but I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, which I probably should have prepared, um, but so it's going to be easier for me just to talk by sitting down. Also, I might squint a little bit, and I apologize for that, but this microphone is not entirely compatible with the wearing of the glasses, so I'll just kind of squint and <laughs> sort of try to recognize um, uh, people. So um, this is sort of the, the, the little presentation I'm going to give us, in, in a sense, a kind of a report on um, a sort of a research agenda or a research project. Um, but it's also sort of a report on a manuscript, a book manuscript in progress uh, as well. And the book manuscript is sort of meant to help kind of commence uh, this sort of uh, research agenda. Um, and it's an agenda that is intended largely for uh, legal or legal academic or policy um, analysts, largely because I think with respect to the economic and financial implications, um, most of you in the room, especially uh, those of you who are associated with the MMT school, have already done an awfully good job of it, and it's hard to see what kind of value that I could add um, on the finance side as distinguished uh, from the law side. That being said, however, uh, I do intend for the project to be economically and financially uh, well-informed. My own doctoral work uh, prior to becoming uh, a legal academic was uh, in the finance uh, field, and so I definitely want to be responsible to what we understand about finance. Um, and, uh, but maybe not to what some people think they understand about finance, while being responsible uh, also to, to, to the law, and the law as we find it, and the law as we could feasibly uh, change it, okay? So, um, so the story is basically this. I'm, uh, what I'm essentially trying to do is, first of all, expose a myth that the MMT folk have done an awfully good job of exposing already, but to expose its operation within the legal academy or within um, uh, legal and policy circles on the one hand, and then replace this myth um, with a myth that's actually true or that's actually correct uh, or closer uh, to, to correct. So the myth I have in, in, in mind, I'm, I'm calling, and again, this is going to be quite familiar to a lot of you, um, I, I'm thinking of it as the intermediated uh, scarce capital myth, right? So we all know the story. Uh, the idea is that financial institutions, not only banks, uh, but other forms of financial institutions as well, investment companies, uh, broker-dealer firms, insurance companies in their uh, financial intermediary capacities and so forth, are essentially in the business of intermediating uh, between suppliers of scarce funds or scarce capital uh, on the one hand, and then would-be end users uh, of that the scarce capital on the other hand. What's absolutely uh, flabbergasting uh, is how regularly, how entirely dependably you can find straightforward articulations of this particular picture um, in finance textbook after finance textbook, in economics textbook after economics uh, textbook, but also in legal textbook after e uh, legal textbook, right? So just a couple of quick quotes. So here's Zibby Bodie and Robert uh, Merton's uh, finance book, a kind of a very f a favorite sort of entry level uh, finance <laughs> text in the business schools. Um, we first find them uh, modeling financial flows as transfers from quote unquote surplus units to deficit units, uh, the latter of which are unpacked as uh, households and, and, and firms. Um, and then we've got uh, Richard Scott Carnell et al.'s book on the law of banks and other financial institutions, probably the most used text uh, in the legal academy among uh, uh, banking professors and the like. Uh, and here's a lovely uh, couple of quotes from this book. Uh, Traditional banking function is that of matching checking account deposits against commercial loans. And then here's another one. Banks as financial intermediaries, quote, take money from investors, pool it, and invest the pooled money in other enterprises, right? Um, later on, they go on to note that, well, because of the money multiplier, because of fractional reserve banking, it's a great business to be in because you can actually lend out a lot more than you get. But somehow the conflict between that observation on the one hand and the earlier two observations on the other never finds its way uh, to being uh, registered. Uh, and finally, just, to, just in order not to belabor the point, um, even a kind of, you know, um, uh, sort of 
trendy, hip sort of uh, reformist uh, manifesto, uh, such as the, that known as The End of Banking, or titled The End of Banking by two people who call themselves Jonathan McMillan, um, it, which this purports to be a, a kind of cutting edge sort of financial reform uh, uh, brief. Um, but it tells us, uh, quote, that matching the different needs of lenders and borrowers is the essence of banking, right? Um, and one could go on and on and on and on, but why, why uh, leave you all to start regurgitating your lunches, right? You all know the story. This is sort of how the story runs. Um, and so uh, I call it the intermediated scarce capital myth uh, for you know, very obvious reasons, right? Um, so um, there are three, I think, uh, particularly salient attributes of this particular view, of this particular uh, myth. Uh, the first is that it's costly, right? Insofar as people actually believe this or think that this is a picture of the world that somehow accurately represents uh, the state of the world, it's quite costly in a number of ways. First of all, of course, it lends uh, a certain air of sort of scientific respectability to uh, uh, lots of sort of retrograde, even reactionary policy proposals. Uh, in particular, uh, austerity, right, uh, is often uh, justified on grounds that, well, capital is scarce. You don't want to kind of scare away all these private suppliers of this scarce resource known as capital, or you don't want to crowd out private investment with public investment. We all know the, uh, the cliches. Um, the scarce capital assumption also finds its way much more uh, pervasively, perniciously, uh, in my view, in lots of areas of the law, right? So anytime people are arguing over whether this or that provision should be added to the, 30 the Securities Act of 1933 or the Securities Exchange Act of 1934 uh, or to any of the bank regulatory uh, acts or to the bankruptcy uh, code uh, or to the regime that covers uh, sovereign uh, insolvency, uh, insolvency among uh, solv uh, sovereign uh, debtors, any time anybody proposes some sort of reform to that, people will immediately say, well, you don't want to scare away the skittish capital or the skittish investors, and what about bond market discipline, and so on. So any kind of attempt to uh, improve uh, these many areas of the law that touch upon finance or enterprise organization um, always meet with this standard objection that, you know, there's only so much in the way of loanable funds. You're going to, you know, all of these people who supply these funds are going to supply the funds elsewhere, and you can't really do anything. Um, finally, um, from the point of view of enterprise organization, uh, this is an area that's particularly close and near and dear to my heart. As you know, there are a lot of people who have been calling for quite some time to a move toward more employee ownership of business, right? Um, or some kind of a move closer to the old artisanal view of labor and capital that we associate with the free labor and free soil movement of the 1860s, Abraham Lincoln being the best known exponent, who would argue that, well, you know, what we really want ultimately is a regime in which labor hires capital rather than capital hiring labor, but of course the standard rejoinder you get to this is from you know, somebody like Paul Samuelson who says, well, there's really a kind of a Kosian situation here. It doesn't really matter whether hi uh, capital hires labor or labor hires capital. You're going to get the same bloody result anyway because capital is scarce and so those who are supplying it are going to demand terms um, uh, in, in order to make it uh, available to the labor who wants to hire it, and so ultimately you're just going to replicate the situation we have right now anyway. So everything's already as snazzy as it can be, leave it well enough alone. But if capital is not scarce, of course, then the immediate uh, response to Samuelson is, that's bullshit, right? And of course, it is bullshit. Um, so I think there's a, l um, you know, insofar as the, uh, as people uh, sort of widely uh, uh, accept the intermediate scarce capital picture, um, it ends up being a very costly fact of our world, and hence a fact that we ought to change if indeed um, it can be changed, or if it's uh, responsible to the, to the truth uh, to change it. Um, the uh, second, I think, maybe salient attribute of this particular view is that it is false. It's completely and radically false. Uh, and it's radically false in ways that I'm going to try to explain uh, in a moment. It's obviously false in one particular realm, and, and the, our, our friends in the MMT school are especially to be credited, I think, for making clear how this is false, and that is in the s within the space of banking, right, of ordinary commercial banking or depository institution uh, 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 lending. Um, but what I'm going to try to show is that it's also true across the financial system as a whole, that every single corner of the financial system is a corner in which the intermediated, the intermediated scarce capital uh, view is false. And then finally, third, the third maybe salient attribute of this particular picture, this particular view, is that it really, in a certain sense, amounts to a metaphor, right? It's a kind of picture, right? How many times have you seen it? I mean, I've seen countless nauseating images on boards where you, there's like a circle in the middle, 
circle to the left, circle to the right. In the middle, it says FI or something for financial institution. Then on the left, you've got you know, providers of scarce capital. And on the right, you have various users of that scarce capital or issuers, right? Um, and that's the picture, right? Um, but of course, again, what's always sort of left out is, well, you know, it's the picture itself doesn't tell you, uh, it doesn't actually prove that the money starts over here, right, comes from these private suppliers and then goes to these private and public end users, that you're sort of just uh, supposed to assume that. But in any event, it's a picture, it's a kind of a metaphor. And so what I'm going to try to do as well in, in this very brief talk is to suggest that there are other metaphors uh, that might be better. Not, not Actually, not even that might be better. Let's just be truthful right up front about it. That just are better, right? <laughs> and, and I'm going to suggest that um, the best way of looking at the financial system as a whole within any nation that has uh, an indefinitely extensible sovereign currency that is managed by a central bank or equivalent monetary authority it's much better to view that system as a kind of franchise arrangement. So this is, of course, going to dovetail nicely with Randy's mention last night of the banking system as a kind of public-private partnership or a sort of a 3P. And I'm going to suggest that the financial system as a whole is best viewed in this way, that this is just the financial system is a finance franchise. The franchisor is the sovereign public. It's dispensing a resource through franchisee institutions that are private. The resource that's being dispensed, I think, in, in within the United States is best characterized as the full faith and credit of the United States, which is dispensed in essentially two forms, either the monetized form or the securitized form, i.e. in the form of Federal Reserve notes uh, or their equivalent on the one hand or Treasury uh, securities uh, on the other hand. Um, and that what we're essentially doing is we're allowing the private franchisees to collect a fee. This amounts basically to privatized seniorage for the function that they play in dispensing this resource. But the only way that they're really going to be adding value in doing so is if they're performing a, a, a truly useful underwriting function or sort of uh, a, a risk classifying uh, system, or as, as Randy was putting it last night, if they're performing a good underwriting function, right? If they're actually capitalizing on um, a sort of producing or gathering Hayekian information of a sort that government agents can't find or produce, then fine, then the seniorage is warranted. But if they're not performing that function or if they're adding at least, uh, I mean, more disvalue than value in this, in this particular respect, then there's no reason to continue to privatize the seniorage. And at the very least, we ought to be placing conditions, not simply garden variety licensure conditions, which of course we call bank charters, but other kinds of condition uh, as well. I'm going to suggest that that's a much better metaphor uh, than the sort of intermediated scarce capital metaphor. Uh, a couple of subsidiary metaphors that I'll occasionally use that I think are also useful. Is you can kind of think of the financial system as a kind of solar system. And the sun that's at the core, that's kind of putting out the energy, is the sovereign public operating primarily through the central bank, but also through the treasury. And then you can think of private banking institutions as sort of planets that are kind of circling this sun. And then you can think of other kinds of financial institutions that are always trying to glom on, mysteriously enough, although if, if, you th if you look under the surface, it doesn't, it's not mysterious at all, but on the surface, it looks mysterious, all these other financial institutions that are always trying to affiliate with banks, always trying to become part of holding company structures, conglomerate structures that always have banks at their centers. In that sense, we can view all of the non-bank financial institutions as sort of moons that are circling around these planets that are then circling around the sun that is the sovereign, again, the sovereign public. And then finally, a final metaphor, maybe you can think of, um, of the financial system as a kind of gas pipeline, right? a kind of an energy pipeline. The energy is the full faith and credit of the United States, or the gas is the full faith and credit of the United States that's, that's being distributed through this system. Then you have various people who are licensed to tap in to this system and use the gas. But then you have other people who sometimes are like those people who kind of, you know, are, you know, in Brooklyn, it seems to happen all the time for some reason. At least that's, that's kind of where I live. I mean, you're always hearing these stories of people kind of siphoning off gas from, right, the, the, the gas utility, and then some explosion at some point uh, occurs. Um, and, and, of course, you know, there are two ways to respond to something like that. One is you find these people and arrest them or insist that they get licenses. Or if you notice that the, you know, the, the PSI and the gas pipes is going down because more of it is being siphoned off, you can just turn it up higher to kind of maintain that PSI, which is sort of what the Greenspan Fed arguably did when a lot of the uh, full faith and credit of the United States was being kind of siphoned out of the pipeline. They just sort of turned up the gas further. And that's, of course, the, the credit, the source of the credit that 
uh, gives us the credit-fueled asset price bubble that ultimately ends in bust, um, pursuant to the, com uh, the, uh, the, I think, the still unsurpassed uh, Minsky uh, model. So I'm going to be playing with those metaphors a little bit, but I'm really going to focus mainly on the, on the franchise side. Okay, um, so I guess what that means uh, next, then, is to um, substantiate the view, right, to sort of explain or try to make clear why this is a, a, a more apt metaphor. The franchise metaphor, in particular, is more apt than the intermediated scarce uh, capital uh, metaphor. Um, so I um, the best way to do this, I think, is to note um, there's a kind of a three-stage process the pursuant to which uh, the franchisor, the sovereign public, effectively dispenses the full faith and credit of the sovereign, in this case of the United States, through these private uh, institutions that function, they're essentially de facto franchisees, right, that are essen essentially uh, collecting private seniorage for the dispensing of a public uh, resource. The first um, is, the, uh, is what um, um, uh, Randy was calling uh, la uh, layering, la layering last night, that you layer uh, leverage upon leverage upon leverage. Um, uh, a private institution does this. Second, then, a federal instrumentality in this country, typically the Fed, at least when we're looking at the banking system, but other in public instrumentalities when we look at other financial institutions that I'll get to, um, uh, something I'm going to call accommodation, uh, which does have an actual recognized orthodox term of art meaning within one context, but can actually be extended to other contexts where it doesn't have that meaning, accommodation, and then finally monetization. So um, with by accommodation, I simply mean the familiar process pursuant to which a private liability is converted into a public liability, right? So the Fed, as you know, accommodates a private bank loan in part by crediting a Federal Reserve account that a member bank actually has when it has extended a loan. That's the familiar form that accommodation takes, but as I'll point out shortly, it takes less familiar forms as well in other uh, contexts. Monetization then is simply um, the, um, the, the process pursuant to which the public liability that that private liability has been converted into can be used to make payments at par, right? That basically it just is money or monetized when you can use whatever the denominated amount of the, the accommodation is in payment of that very amount of some sort of obligation that one owes, right? So um, it's very easy to trace, or maybe I shouldn't say easy, but it's, it's, it's not altogether difficult, let's say, to trace precisely this dynamic, this process throughout the financial system, okay? So starting um, with the banks, that's probably pretty familiar to everybody already. This is one of the focuses of, of MMT, of course. It's also uh, something that's emphasized by the Bank of England, and it's very helpful sort of uh, a video series on what banks do and how they connect up with the central bank. And of course, it's been noted several times in the last couple of days by some of you who have made presentations, right? So a bank doesn't kind of sit around waiting for a bunch of deposits to come in before it goes out and makes a loan. A bank makes a loan to a particular borrower. When it does that, it then opens or credit, it either opens an account in the name of that borrower or credits a pre-existing such account. That particular transaction now books as an asset and a liability on the part of the borrower and as an asset and a liability on the part of the bank, right? Then, in turn, right, the Fed, the, uh, the central bank or the monetary authority is, if it's particularly if it operates a payment clearing system or a check clearing system, is going to have to accommodate this particular new asset whom liability that the bank has undertaken, else it has to reject certain checks that might be made in payment of this obligation or that. In other words, checks will fail to clear. That, of course, mucks up the payment system. That, of course, brings the damned economy to a grinding halt. So the accommodation, and I think Randy actually brings this out terrifically well in, in his latest uh, book as well, that basically the Fed doesn't really have much choice, right, if it's going to be operating uh, a, a payment system on the one hand, and at the same time is going to be, you know, overseeing banks that are making loans on the other hand in the way that banks do. So effectively the Fed has to accommodate in order to permit clearing, and of course in this particular uh, case, the accommodation is already monetized because it's essentially accommodating an opened bank account, which just is a form of something that you can make payments of, a source of uh, a, 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 a component of the, of the money supply. Um, all of that, I think, is again pretty well established, um, for especially by the MMT folk, and some of the more even some of the more sophisticated Orthodox folk might recognize at least that much 
but then still somehow be muddled in their heads about, well, but what about reserve requirements and blah, 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 and how does that all fit? Um, it's clear that reserve requirements aren't necessary and that fractional reserve banking isn't really a part of the story here. Is, 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 it's quite obvious, partly just by looking at the fact that other jurisdictions like you know, the UK and Australia don't even impose uh, reserve requirements. All right, what might be less clear to some people is that the same, essentially the same dynamic or the same phenomenon is underway in other sectors uh, of the financial economy. Um, and this maybe hasn't been as fully explored as it, as it might be, and that's one thing I'm trying to do and one way I'm hoping to sort of uh, add value. So um, begin uh, maybe with the capital markets. Um, so the capital markets are probably the first refuge of the scoundrels who still want to say that the financial system is about intermediated scarce capital. Because they'll say, well, all right, let's just suppose for the sake of argument, but I'm not really admitting this, but just for the sake of argument, let's suppose that you're right about the banking system, so that the banking system is not really about intermediated scarce capital. Well, surely the capital markets or the securities markets are, right? Surely this is a case where particular issuing firms are issuing right, uh, d debt instruments and equity instruments, and then various uh, uh, participants in the markets buy up these things, and that's kind of classic intermediation, is it not? Um, and the answer is um, no, <laughs> it's not. It's not quite right uh, to put things that way. It's probably that sector that comes closest uh, to that model, but it still is not a sector that, that is accurately captured uh, by that model. Uh, and here's why. There are a couple of, uh, a couple of reasons or a couple of things that uh, emphasize. Um, the first is if you note, uh, if you look at the history uh, of all of the major capital markets in the world, they all begin as sites at which public debt is dispensed. They all begin as distribution sites for public debt. In other words, public debt is enabling private debt, right? That's the first point. And this, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about Amsterdam, I'm talking about London, I'm talking about New York, Paris, Tokyo, Frankfurt. Every one of these starts out as a public debt dispensary site, which then finds private Secu uh, private transactions kind of piggybacking on public. That's an historical correlation, but then we can also explain that correlation by reference to a kind of functional explanation. And when we look at the functional explanation, the case becomes even clearer, things becomes much clearer. Um, so the key point here um, is that um, capital markets as we find them today cannot, it seems, never have and it's apparently cannot function without a certain chunk of them being represented by something that you can think of as safe assets, right? And the term safe assets has become something of a term of art over the years in the literature. Different writers seem to have slightly different things in mind when they use the term. But in general, what they seem to be talking about is some class of assets that is readily liquidatable at par and hence can function as a kind of money substitute, right? Something that is almost money, if not indeed money. And what's sort of remarkable, if you look at the history of the securities markets going all the way back to the 14th, 13th, 14th century, there's been some really interesting empirical work done by Gary Gorton and a couple of other people on the so-called safe asset share. And what's remarkable is through time, the share of all securities markets that's represented by these so-called safe assets remains constant even as those markets grow and grow and grow, and even as they grow not only in absolute terms, but as percentages of GDP in within the jurisdictions in which they operate. That safe asset share is constant through time. That, of course, makes one wonder, well, why might that be? What might the explanation be? And there seem to be a couple of explanations, right? One is it appears that participants in these capital markets require something that you can think of as a kind of liquidity reservoir, right? Something into which they can kind of cash out at time, during times of crisis or during times of turbulence. They need something safe into which they can transform their more speculative and more risky assets. And it turns out that, of course, lo and behold, in the securities markets, those are primarily the so-called safe assets, and by far the lion's share of the safe assets are sovereign debt securities here in the U.S., in particular, treasuries. And again, as uh, you've probably heard a million times, the U.S. treasuries market is by far the largest individual securities market in the world, has been for ages now, looks like it probably will be for, you know, indefinitely into the future as well. In any event, that serves, treasuries serve as a sort of liquidity uh, reservoir. The um, second explanation is that they really seem to function as necessary benchmarks. And I'm not talking in this case just about a kind of 
oft encountered kind of practical empirical reality, I'm also talking about what seems to be almost a theoretical uh, reality or a theoretical necessity. If any of you who follow or know a bit about financial theory and all of the sort of innovations and the so-called you know, revolution in financial theory commencing in the 1960s and you know, kind of running through the 1970s, any of, you, any of you people who follow this stuff know that every single asset pricing model that turns out to be usable in uh, the actual markets makes essential use of one so-called risk-free asset, right? This starts with Harry Markowitz's 1952 dissertation, which ultimately became uh, the book known as uh, is a portfolio, modern portfolio, yeah. So uh, it, it which becomes that, that his seminal book. It's in Sharp and Lintner. It's, of course, in the CAF-M. Every single model, it's usable. There's only one model that doesn't make use of a so-called risk-free asset, and that's the so-called black cap M, which turns out to be too unwieldy to use, actually, in the financial markets. So even as it seems that even as a theoretical matter, there has to be, it's, uh, I want to use the Voltaire uh, line about God, right? If God didn't exist, he'd have to be invented. If safe assets didn't exist, they would have to be invented. They kind of were, in a sense, right, in modern portfolio theory, but then, lo and behold, what do you know? There actually happens to be one. It's treasuries, right? Also, of course, uh, 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 even Tobin's portfolio, uh, early sort of contributions seem to make, require some kind of safe asset as a benchmark. So in order even to price the bloody securities that the private issuers are supplying or, or, or issuing, you need some kind of safe asset to come up with determinative prices, and that safe asset turns out to be treasuries, right? Or, again, some equivalent safe asset of which there doesn't seem to be any at this, at this point. Finally, the third uh, reason for the uh, explanation for the sort of safe asset share takes us into another realm of the financial system, and that is the, the use of safe assets as a kind of shadow bank-based money, right, or as a kind of uh, a transaction technology, as some people call them. So the so-called shadow banking markets, as I'm about to describe, themselves require the presence of these of essentially securitized full faith and credit of the United States otherwise known as treasury securities. They make use of these in order to operate, and indeed these treasuries function kind of in the way that so-called base money does in one uh, portrayal of how the monetary system works, right, with Fed base money serving as the kind of base for the so-called multiplier. Um, so I'll, I'll, do, I'll transition now quickly into uh, the so-called shadow uh, banking uh, market. So I think Randy very helpfully noted last night that it's a mistake to think of shadow banks as being an altogether parallel sort of sector of the financial system that's somehow distinct from or operating in parallel with the banking system. It's as, it's as, it's mistake, it's as mistaken to view them as operating separate from or sort of orthogonally to the banking system as it is to view the securities markets as operating orthogonally to um, the banking uh, system. Um, so they, they're connected, but what I'm going to emphasize is even if you didn't look at the connections, even if you were to ignore the links between shadow banking and traditional banking, it would still be easily shown that the shadow banking markets operate in much the same way as the regular banking markets do in the sense of essentially dispensing this public resource that I'm calling the full faith and credit of the United States through uh, the same process of accommo uh, accommodation and uh, monetization with lots of layering that we find in regular banking. So just to keep things simple, I'm going to divide um, my brief treatment of the shadow banking markets into, first, the repo markets, uh, second, uh, the derivative uh, markets, and then finally, third, uh, the commercial paper and money markets. Okay. So here's how it all works. In the case of the repo markets, you probably already know what that is, but just in case you don't, with the repo, what I do is I sell, some, I sell my laptop to Matt, and I also convey to him an agreement to buy it back from him tomorrow, and I'm going to buy it back from him at a slightly higher price than I'm selling it to him today. And of course, that extra amount is essentially my borrowing fee, and the laptop, in turn, is the collateral for the transaction. And of course, the repo markets are became have become huge. Int interesting, interestingly enough, the repo transaction was actually invented by the Fed, which ought to tell you something right off the bat, <laughs> way back during the First World War as a means of covering short-term borrowing needs in financing the war effort yeah. during the First World War. But ignoring all of that for the moment, the way repo works, and it's a, essentially a very short term form of borrowing. 
but you can roll over, you know, day to day. You can just say, you know, I, I m you know, I say, Matt, um, do you mind if I don't buy the uh, laptop back from you today, but we put it off for tomorrow? And he says, Sh sure. <laughs> well, if he says, sure, then I just pay him a little bit more, and you can kind of keep rolling over, keep extending the loan, so to speak, indefinitely. But now here's the, here's the real key. You can rehypothecate. This is where layering comes in. You can rehypothecate. Re, um, I'm going to stick with Matt for the moment. Matt has my laptop. Matt can use my laptop in turn as collateral and borrowing that he does. And then the person he sells the laptop to can sell it on further. This is called rehypothecation. And there's no inherent limit to this rehypothecating. And with each rehypothecation, there is more lending happening. But the collateral stays the same. It's just the bloody laptop. It's the one bloody laptop, right? But what this means is that the laptop is functioning kind of like base money in the, in the kind of standard central bank lending store, central bank uh, mon money system story. It's functioning as the sort of base money. And you can layer debt upon debt upon debt upon debt. You're basically just increasing the aggregate of leverage that is associated with this one piece of collateral whose value doesn't change. And insofar as there's no limit on that rehypothecation, there's no limit on that form of money creation or money generation, which is this short-term lending, right? So that, that's where the layering comes in. Where does the accommodation come, come in? Well, as it happens, all repo transactions clear through two basic clearing banks, right? One is Bank of New York Mellon, BNY Mellon. Interestingly enough, by the way, BNY is a bank that Alexander Hamilton and a guy named Isaac Roosevelt, yes, one of those Roosevelts, chartered way back in the 18th century. It's the oldest banking institution in the United States, um, uh, private banking institution. And it is uh, one of the two principal clearing houses for repo transactions. The other uh, is, uh, can also be uh, represented by three uh, uh, letters, JPM, right, JP Morgan. Um, and now those two facilities, in turn, are guaranteed by the Fed and they have access to the Fed discount window, the very same discount window that the commercial banks have access to. And in this sense, the Fed is accommodating repo transactions. It's guaranteeing them. It's standing behind them exactly as it effectively accommodates and stands behind bank lending transactions pursuant to the model that the MMT folk have laid out so well and that the, mono, uh, and that the uh, 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 positive money folk have laid out well and that the Bank of England has laid out well and so forth. Um, and then as far as the monetization goes, well, that's kind of obvious, I suppose, because the repo transaction is itself already effectively a money transaction because the, the borrower is effectively using money that is supplied by the person to whom he sells or he or she sells the, the laptop in my, uh, my example. Now, the final point maybe to make about repo, by the way, is that the favored collateral that's used in the repo markets is not laptops, it is treasury securities, right? So treasury, basically it, we, what we can say is that repo is effectively a publicly supplied form of financing all the way down, right? The favored collateral is public debt, and then all of the lending that's done is accommodated by the Fed, it is already monetized, and you can layer and layer and layer ad infinitum, right? And so in that sense, you can just keep on extending credit in the same way that a bank can keep extending credit without really being constrained by uh, uh, so-called reserve uh, ratios or required reserves uh, at all. Okay, so that's, that's repo. Um, moving next then uh, to uh, derivatives. Um, so the derivatives markets, um, as you all know, uh, are very straightforwardly like lending. I mean, a derivative transaction typically is just a synthetic loan transaction. That's often what it will be referred to, right? Um, so derivatives are straightforwardly lending, and they're, of course, lending um, that is, that takes, that is uh, denominated in, in, in dollars here in the States. It's, it's, it's already monetized. Um, so the question does becomes, well, in what sense is it layered? In what sense can essentially credit aggregates that are, um, that are incurred through the derivative process, in what way do they layer up in the way that bank loans can layer up and in the way that repo debt can uh, layer up? Well, it's quite straightforward. It's very easy to kind of uh, uh, show, uh, sort of to intuitively to explain how this can be by noting com if you compare a derivative on the one hand to its insurance policy counterpart on the other hand, right? So in the case of an insurance policy, if I want to insure my house against it being burnt down, I effectively enter into a bet with a uh, fire insurance company, right? I, in a, I sort of bet that my house will burn down, 
so that if I win the bet, I get the money that I need to rebuild the house, right? So I'm in that sense, I'm, in, in a, I'm engaged in a kind of gambling transaction with the insurance company, right? And the insurance company, quote unquote, wins if I lose, which is if my house doesn't burn down. But here's the key. I can only insure my own house, right? This is what's known as the insurable interest doctrine, right? So within the insurance markets, you can only insure what you actually have an insurable interest in. And that places a natural limit on the proliferation of the kind of obligation that I or the insurance company might incur relative to one another, right? Think of a derivative as effectively as an insurance policy without an insurable interest doctrine, right? So now, not only can I insure my house, but Matt can insure my house, right? And Pavlina can insure my house, and so can Randy. All of you guys can effectively bet on my house. And what that means is, in effect, we layer up, right? We lever up all sorts of credit debt obligations among various people, all of them based on just this one little house. And in this sense, you can analogize my house to the laptop in the repo case and to so-called base money and, again, the standard sort of Fed and bank system story. You just layer it, layer it, layer it, layer it up, and there's absolutely no limit. And that's, of course, one reason why derivative commitments, the notional amount or the notional value of derivative commitments, so often utterly dwarf every other aggregate out there, including, of course, GDP. Um, so that's sort of how layering uh, works uh, in the uh, derivatives markets. How does, what's the analog to accommodation? What is the analog to Fed accommodation to bank loans? Well, it's pretty straightforward again. Before Dodd-Frank, uh, but it is sort of, there's a pre-2010, post-2010 sort of here. Pre-2010, derivatives transactions cleared through a couple of central clearing banks, our old friends BNY Mellon and JPM again. And those banks, again, were guaranteed by the Fed and had access to the Fed discount window. So those derivative transactions were already in large part accommodated. But the story gets even better or worse, depending on how you want to look at it, post-2010, because Dodd-Frank, under Title VIII thereof, recognizes derivative clearing houses as, a as an essential public, u as an essential financial utility or market utility. And the Fed is right now cooking up a whole regime pursuant to which it is going to accommodate these new clearing houses, derivatives clearing houses, uh, by, by giving them access, direct access to the discount window that JPM and BNY Mellon already have. So in effect, what's sort of curious, n you, you're probably noticing a pattern now. In the case of ordinary banks, by in order to guarantee check clearing, the Fed accommodates privately extended bank loans. In the repo markets, in order to accommodate loans that are extended in the repo form, um, the Fed uh, guarantees another form of clearing. I, I mean, it, it basically, I'm sorry, in order to guarantee one form of clearing, it backstops a particular institution and gives it access to the discount window. And then now, if we move to derivatives, same story. In order to guarantee clearing, just like check clearing again, we find the Fed accommodating by offering access to the discount window to the clearing facility, right? All right, final case um, in the, in the uh, 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 shadow banking markets, um, the commercial paper um, and uh, money markets. Um, so here, you guys all probably know this story fairly well already. Um, as you know, a new kind of mutual fund uh, developed in the 1970s and then began to proliferate and became very popular and came to be used as a sort of a bank substitute, right? And this is the money market mutual fund. So the mutual money market mu mutual fund is simply a, a mutual fund that purchases very short-term commercial paper, typically this is under a year, uh, or with maturity less than a year, that various firms uh, issue in order to finance their sort of short-term uh, borrowing uh, needs. So essentially, you've got people who put money into the money market mutual funds, which then invest that money in the into this uh, uh, commercial uh, paper, right? Now, um, what, how, in what sense does this end up replicating the, the traditional banking system? Well, in one sense, it's very obvious, right? Basically, the, um, the, the money market mutual funds were allowed essentially to uh, dispense with ordinary accounting rules so as to be able to price shares at exactly $1 per share. And they could also offer transaction accounts on these particular accounts that people maintained at the money market mutual funds so that people actually came to use them as, as bank substitutes, right? They, you'd, you'd write checks on your uh, money market mutual fund account. As some of you know also, when some of those funds began to get into trouble in 2008, and some of them began to, what they call, break the buck, um, they immediately were given access to the Federal Reserve discount window, 
and the FDIC, of course, extended deposit insurance to money market mutual fund accounts. And that's all very interesting, and that all is a sense in which you can see how something outside of the ordinary banking system that wasn't regulated as the ordinary banks are is, was kind of post hoc accommodated. But that's actually not the most interesting part of the story. The most interesting part of the story are these, uh, are these two parts. First, um, commercial paper itself is itself already immediately discountable through the discount window under Section 372 of the Federal Reserve Act. So the very asset in which the money market mutual funds are investing is itself in, in that sense guaranteed by the fund, immediately monetizable by the, uh, the fund. Freudian slip, not the IMF now, the Fed, um, is, is itself uh, guaranteed by the Fed and immediately monetizable by the Fed. But furthermore, another critical function that the money market mutual funds have played is they engage in repo transactions themselves. They do a lot of the repo lending. In fact, they are the mats in the, in the example that I was just giving, the, among the primary mats, the primary suppliers of the, of the repo credit, right? So in effect, what that means is if you think about it, you've got quote unquote depositors on the one hand, those who invest in the money market mutual fund, but the money market mutual fund is able to lend much more, right, than it actually is taking in from these quote unquote depositors by taking the counterparty role in repo transactions, which again can be layered and layered and layered in the way that, we were that I was describing uh, a moment ago. And furthermore, the asset itself, the primary asset in which the, the MMMs deal in the first place is itself immediately monetizable because it has under 372 of the Federal Reserve Act this, this access to the discount window. So the money market mutual fund system and the commercial paper system, those sectors of the so-called shadow banking sector as well replicate in effect this basic formula, right, this kind of money multiplication formula that you already find at work in the traditional banking system. And what that means in turn is that the loanable, the, the intermediated scarce loanable funds model of finance is as untrue in all of the other sectors of the financial system as it is in the banking sector. I'm probably almost out of time, right? Is that, I am? Okay, so um, all right. So wh what I was going to say is I was going to, but well, actually there'll be time later. Is I was going to suggest okay, there's some pretty important policy implications I think that come from this, and part of this research agenda that I'm embarked on in this kind of book that I'm working on is to start drawing some policy implications. What would a world without the scarce capital, a scar intermediate scarce capital myth look like? What might it look like? And how might we basically take advantage of the fact that we really are a franchisor, that all of these various financial institutions are de facto franchisees of, but who are not you know, paying high enough licensing fees and are sort of you know, screwing everything up for us. But I'll, I'll leave that for later. Thank you, Robert. Our next speaker is Ron Gray. He's a research fellow at the Benzaga Institute for Sustainable Prosperity and the founder um, and president of the Modern Money uh, Network, which is a global learning uh, initiative um, that promotes public understanding of money and finance. I'm very excited um, to hear his talk because we've been engaged in this discussion about whether money is a creature of uh, the state or creature of law. Ron Gray. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, sorry, is this working all right? It's, it's on, so that's good. Yeah. My deepest thanks to Fidel, uh, Matt, Said, and the Benzaga Institute, as well as Denison University, uh, and to everyone who's contributed to make this conference happen. Um, I stand before you today as a card-carrying, albeit self-invited, member of the modern money uh, movement, uh, but it doesn't seem like that long ago when I was uh, had no formal affiliation with MMC, but was just another 20-something law student who, in an attempt to make sense of the 2008 crisis, uh, accidentally fell down the intellectual rabbit hole of debates and personality politics and flame wars that we call the uh, econoblogosphere. Um, so all of that changed, actually, on a cloudy Wednesday in April of 2012 when I impulsively decided to attend a modern money-themed uh, conference at the Ford Foundation in New York rather than endure yet a, another lazy lecture by my lazy torch professor on the allegedly profound insights of the law and economics movement. Um, and uh, my decision to attend this conference wasn't particularly strategic or well thought out. Uh, I was just really kind of 
interested in uh, seeing some of the kind of quasi-mythical uh, people whose words I'd stayed up reading on so many late nights, and as luck would have it, ended up uh, on a lunch table with Pavlina, or I guess I'm supposed to call her Pav now that we're good friends. Uh, so that lunch ultimately resulted in our first MMT-inspired and not very creatively titled seminar series at Columbia, uh, which in turn led to the birth of the Modern Money Network, and with it a, seem a seemingly endless succession of seminars, writings, reading groups, Facebook arguments, and late night conspiratorial planning sessions. Um, so my personal road to MMT, while not as ideologically turbulent as Saeed uh, was talking about yesterday, was similarly informal, and owes a similar debt to the uh, information democratizing power of new media. So today I think I can quite confidently say I'm in this struggle for the duration, and although the Modern Money Network is still small and scrappy and eternally cash-strapped, uh, I'm optimistic about our future. Uh, I won't go into detail about our operations, but you can see what we're up to on our website, uh, modernmoneynetwork.org. But to give one example, our YouTube channel, which at present contains only a, a fraction of our total video archive, uh, has received over 170,000 views since it was first established over two and a half years ago. Um, of course, compared to uh, Pavlina's famous inequality chart, or Scott's sectoral balances chart, or uh, Bill Mitchell's millions of blog hits, or, or Bill Black's prolific interviews, or Stephanie's you know, visibility in Congress, 170,000 views is a drop in the ocean, but for us as a volunteer, student-driven, uh, largely self-financed organization that's yet to get to four years old, uh, I, I think, we, you know, I hope I'm not too presumptuous in saying we've made a little bit of headway and we're only really looking forward. Um, so, at any rate, my goal today isn't to advertise our network. Uh, what I want to make the case, or at least give a summary of the case for, uh, is a legal approach to framing and thinking about media. Uh, and before I go further, I want to make two confessions. Uh, the first confession is that I'm not an economist. Uh, I studied a little bit of political economy at, as an undergraduate and spent more time in law school reading and thinking about economics than I would ever admit to my professors. Uh, but as a general rule, I don't really construct or deconstruct charts or graphs or time series or algebraic models. Uh, I don't really do anything else that could fairly be described as crunching the numbers. So I have at best an outsider's understanding of the economist's quantitative approach to economic analysis and I you know, I'm not sure how much else we should save of Adam Smith, but I guess I'm willing to keep the division away from him. Um, the second con uh, confession is, although that I'm here wearing a, a lawyer's hat, yeah, I said that, sorry, um, I'm not yet a lawyer, or I should be more accurate um, and say that I'm a not yet lawyer. Which is not to say I don't have something to say about the law. Uh, I have a formal education and practical experience that probably gives me some insight. Uh, and I'm definitely more of a lawyer than an economist, which is for the purposes of this talk is probably the most important distinction. Uh, but until I gain admission to the New York bar, uh, I, you know, in the MMT view, until I pay my credentials tax, uh, I can't represent myself as a proper lawyer. So for our purposes, uh, I'm, I'm just a, a lawyerist. Um, and, and that might sound like a bit of a semantic distinction, but like so many silly semantic distinctions in law, it has real practical effects. And what that means is, uh, for me, if the US government had another shutdown tomorrow, and I wanted to try and bring a lawsuit against the Treasury for you know, violating the Constitution by not minting the coin, and I really do, um, it would probably be you know, the exact same as Rob in California, which is to say I'd have to go out and hire an actual lawyer, which is a big problem given the level of understanding of the average lawyer about money. Uh, and I'll get to back to that in a second. <laughs> now, I should note at this point that unlike me, Bob is a real lawyer, and I, so I trust he's not going to let me get away with saying anything too outrageous on behalf um, and not only is Bob a lawyer, but he's a law professor, which means he makes lawyers in addition to being a lawyer. And it's really great that we have professors like Bob who get it at places like Cornell, because when it comes to what Saeed said yesterday about targeting the street level government bureaucrats in, in the government to change the way that we talk and think about money, a lot of that involves institution building and culture building and relationship building. And that's lawyer work. <laughs> you typically don't get your foot in the door in those places without elite credentials, so it, 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 it matters that he's at Cornell as well. The bad news is uh, that we can't simply use keystrokes to generate a million lawyers like Bob. Uh, we have a system that produces lawyers, but the number of them that come out like him is pretty small. Uh, and if you know anything about the sociology of law schools, that really isn't a surprise. Um, Bob once described himself to me as someone with a private interest head and a public interest heart, which to me is the legal equivalent of what Randy was saying yesterday with me spend having a Wall Street view of money. Um, and if you've ever been to a law school uh, or sat in a class, you'll understand why that's such a fragile place to occupy. Uh, because most of the public interest-oriented legal minds don't want to spend much time thinking about finance. <laughs> that's why they went to law school, uh, even though many of them end up working at least for a while in big 
So they get an implicit education in capitalism there from that perspective, whether they know it or not. And most of the private ones who do think about these things aren't going to tell anybody what they've learned because they're there to get money and power. Uh, so they're not going to be whistleblowers. Um, but there's a lot of us in government, and it's important. It's important to know that there is a distinction, and it's important to know that the people trying to fight the fights that we care about in law aren't the ones who are in the right, uh, who are thinking and spending a lot of time about money and power, at least overall. Now, the, the problem's deeper, though, than just student debt. Despite the huge proliferation of law and finance professors in recent years and the ubiquity of economics concepts in the legal curriculum, the state of legal scholarship around money is dismal. And there are some gr green shoots uh, that have begun sprouting since the crisis. And it's worth noting here, in addition to Bob's work with his colleague Soleil Omarova at Cornell, the work of Christine Duvan at Harvard, and the work of Katarina Kuske at Columbia. But overall, the legal intellectual landscape remains very poor. And let me just use a couple of quotes here from Lloyd Kreitner, who is another name that should be acknowledged in this conversation, uh, on a great little article he wrote in 2012 called The Legal History of Money. He says, one might have expected the legal history of money would be a well-developed field with an accepted corpus of primary and derivative works and a set paradigm of problems and debates with well-defined canon. But in fact, the legal history of money is a field in the making. There are works but no canon. There is no accepted set of questions that a legal history of money must answer or even ask. No basic division into theoretical outlooks around which to organize a field. Imagine a student comes into office hours and wants to study the legal history of contract, tort, or marriage. One barely has to think to get her started in the right direction, and there may even be encyclopedia articles from which to draw initial bibliographies. Nothing of the sort exists for the legal history of money, at least not yet. So that's the condition of our legal union, so to speak. And given that condition, given that the law doesn't want to come to modern money, at least at the moment, um, I would like to suggest that what we need to do is bring modern money to the law. So my basic argument, put as simply as I can for now, is now that MMT has progressed from being ignored to being ridiculed and now treated with the cautious respect of a worthy adversary, it's time to move beyond the hierarchical morality and simplifying rhetoric of the state and towards the horizontal morality and complicating rhetoric of law. Or to borrow my own term, it's time for us as a movement to become not lawyers per se, but lawyerist economists, right? So let me briefly explain what I mean. First, uh, while MMT views itself as a state theory of money, it is in fact more broadly a legal theory of money. <laughs> and that point that money is a legal institution was made explicitly by early developers of MMT and is important for three reasons. Uh, the first, as Harvard uh, professor Chris Dezan has so brilliantly demonstrated with her scholarship on the legal history of uh, British and American money, is that the political dynamics and social narratives that drive government activity vary widely depending on their legal histories. And those histories are obviously dependent on local context. The second is Katarina Pistor. Oh, sorry, yes, this is what I was suggesting that it's time for MMT to be. <laughs> sorry, my uh, PowerPoint's got a little bit of a uh, Okay. The second is Katarina, uh, as Columbia Law Professor Pis Katarina Pistor and her project colleagues emphasize, legal power is not perfectly analogous to state power. Indeed, law is arguably deeper and broader. I want to quote from a, a, a paper here that, uh, by Pistor and her colleagues called Legal Institutionalism and Capital, uh, uh, Capitalism and the Constitutive Law, Constitutive Law of Law. She says, uh, this, th there are two prim primary ontological claims they're making about law. The first is that law, at least in its fullest and most developed sense, necessarily involves both the state, broadly construed to refer to a realm of public ordering, and private or customary relations. Reduction of law to just one of those aspects is a mistake. Law involves an institutionalized judiciary and a legislative apparatus. The second ontological claim is that law, understood as the outcome of both state intervention and private ordering, accounts for many of the rules and structures of modern capitalist society. Consequently, it's not simply an expression of power relations, but is also a constitutive part of the institutionalized power structure and a major means through which power is exercised. So this is not to suggest that the state, uh, that the law is everything or that the state doesn't have a role. Uh, but it is to suggest that in analyzing modern capitalism, an understanding of the role of law is vital. So by starting the story with the assumption of a fully functioning state, and by conflating social action via the state with social action via the law, the risk is that MMT opens so, uh, itself up to criticism of theoretical under-inclusivity, and even more problematically, unwarranted guilt by semantic association for the sins of the state 
and state policies that, uh, that MMT in no way advocates in Australia. And I say it's unfair because as people like our own Rob Parents have demonstrated with his Austro MMT sense, it, it's possible to start from a highly state skeptical perspective and nevertheless end up at MMT's progressive and socially just conclusions about employment, money, and the central role of the state in the 21st century. Third, right? now this is Warren Mosley's point, right? The state creates unemployment. If it's gonna create unemployment, it, ob it obligates itself to provide for it. That's not because we love the state, it's because the state got in our way and has done something and now it has to fix it. So third, it's important that money is a legal institution because law is not just a social technology, law is a mode of social action. So in that sense, everybody here who has chosen to make change through persuasion and education rather than violence is already engaging in, in lawyering in a broader sense. And as a mode of social action, law has some special properties that distinguish it from other ways of affecting public policy. The first is that law is contrary to what many people believe, an incredibly weak mode of social control. One of my law professors used to say there's more social control in table manners than there is in most things. But it's in that weakness that we find both the beauty and the morality of law as a particular mode of social action. The second is that unlike military or economic power, legal power can, in certain situations, be wielded to great effect, even under conditions of vast resource and power disparity, provided those who are wielding it are sufficiently smart in how they go about doing so. One only needs to look at class action tort lawsuits against car manufacturers and cigarette makers to get an idea of what I mean. And the good news on that front is that because legal systems are also social technologies, they're evolutionary, which means there are new opportunities every day as society develops. The third and perhaps most important property is that legal power can be wielded in service of and in defense against the state. And we don't need to go back to the Magna Carta to get an idea of how important such a defense can be on behalf of public policy. Take, for example, the US government surveillance programs that were revealed by Edward Snowden. Now, whether you think those programs are necessary to promote public national security or a huge violation of civil liberties, uh, it's undeniable that the way in which the US government operated in enacting these programs, with its secret advisor court and open policy to Congress by the Director of National Se Intelligence, James Clapper, involved a fundamental breakdown of trust. So even if this policy was good for the state, it was bad for the rule of law. So that's the basic outline of my argument. One, a state is not a state is not a state. Two, law is bigger than the state. And three, revolutions based on law can avoid the kinds of injustices that revolutions based on state power more generally can lead to. Now, one response that you might hear to this is, well, that's all very well, but we're talking about economic theory, and the state's a useful shorthand because we can't all go and, and talk about 10 years of law every time we want to talk about policy. And I hear you, I, I really do. Um, but I would like to suggest that at this phase of the conversation, as we turn our attention to questions of framing and the practical challenges of implementation that are going to gain more salience as MMT gets closer to power and you know, nearer the end of its 20 year marathon and starts getting into the stadium for those final few laps. At this phase, holding onto the conception of the state as a single unified entity is reductive, as, uh, as reductive as a representative agent of the nation state. Right? Um, and we need to go beyond uh, and we need to go beyond this reduction because continuing to rely on the fiction of a single entity called the state uh, opens it up to criticisms that can be avoided and simultaneously protects space for our enemy in which to continue making counter arguments that are facially plausible but under the surface completely incoherent. And the most obvious example you hear of this is let's assume a free market without government taxation. <laughs> I mean, let's putting aside the modern money point, and I think it's very pertinent. How do you have a state without property rights and contracts? It doesn't work. Now, there are some crazy, far Austro, uh, you know, Austrian anarcho-capitalists who try to develop models. But those models are far more speculative than anything we're talking about. There's not, there's not a model that, we, that exists of a capitalist free market that doesn't require legal institutions. So it's possible, knowingly, to have a, a, a fragmentation of the other side. The Milton Friedman Mises crowd has to defend the state, which means you have the modern money point. The anarcho-capitalists don't want money, and we saw this with Warren Mosley's debate that we held 
with, uh, with Bob Murphy, the ones who don't want the state, run into property and contract. So th any way they go, we've got them pinned. We just need to, we need to keep the conversation focused on the law, whether it's taxes driving money or whether it's property. So you can't have, uh, yeah. And the second big point is that there is a huge evidentiary benefit to grounding your case on the differential between the law. In addition to making you look very serious and smart, which is a value in and of itself in the court of public opinion, you can actually point to a law and force the other side to acknowledge its existence or accept that they're living in a land that isn't reality. Right? You can talk about whether money is a creature of the state or not and have a million word fight, or you can just point to an article in the Constitution and force them to deal with it. Right? And here's another quote that gets to the point that I was making about Bob Murphy. This is a legal realist from the 1980s. You don't hear this kind of argument in economics very often, and you really should, because it doesn't, you can't get much further than that in Bob Murphy. So by piv pivoting from the fuzzy binary of markets and state to a more concrete discussion of property and contract, it's possible to shut down that line of thinking before it gets there. And from the perspective of a lawyerist economist or an economist lawyerist, saying that money is a creature of the state or money is a creature of law should be the starting point of our argument, not the end point. Joan Robinson uh, with my skin. <coughs> another, another response is that it's simply not as rhetorically persuasive to talk about the law compared to talking about the state. Right? You, don't, you don't see people going on the street talking about the, the, the most recent doctrine of, uh, uh, of insurance that, that Bob was talking about, but you do people hear people talking about how the government is overpowering the state. And so there's, there's also a point there as well. But I want to push back about this point because there's a stark difference between the intellectual and moral confidence by which the average person ap approaches social con questions when they're posited as questions of economics versus when they're posited as questions of law. At least this is true in the United States. Where I come from, the average person on the street would be lucky to know the name of a high court justice, yet alone carry a, a copy of the Constitution in front of them. But in the US, this difference is stark. And to see what I mean, we only have to compare the conversation around Hobby Lobby or Citizens United or the American uh, uh, the Healthcare Act to conversations around the Federal Reserve's interest rate hike. I mean, do you see the kind of moral outrage and certitude by which the average person thinks that the Fed is going to make a mistake? No. But they're quite comfortable attacking nine Supreme Court justices, no matter their level of legal education and elite credentials. Right? So law has an undeniably technocratic element, like economics and finance, but it also lives in our gut. Right? And when the public writ large feels like the law in the books goes against the law in their gut, well, that's some social power right there. And it's that social power that I think, or my argument is that we're going to be able to use to defeat the myth, to defeat the myth of the dollar. Because it's not just immoral or, or bad economics, it's, it's that it's illegal. We're a nation of laws and it's illegal, or it should be at least. Right? And if you accept the basic MMT premise, as I was saying before, that unemployment is a function of taxation, combined with exclusion from the means of producing that which is needed to pay taxes, right, then it's possible to stand in favor of policies like a job guarantee from a place of justice, not just a place of efficiency and effort, pure justice. So I have one last point that I want to make, but before I do, I want to make two quick clarifications. The first is that my aim today isn't to criticize the work of the people in this room or of earlier generations of economists that got us where we are but rather to try and offer a bit of a friendly provocation to suggest a new direction for our movement at what I consider to be a pretty pivotal, pivotal turning point. I'm, I'm not asking us to uh, bury uh, the core insights and claims of MMT, which I think are absolutely correct, but I am asking us to bury the state or at least turn the volume down on it a little bit. And the second clarification is that I'm not suggesting that we excise state power from our analysis or assume that the difference between the state and everything else doesn't exist. Rather, what I'm suggesting is that we do the opposite. We embrace the challenge of getting more granular about the state, more nuanced about the role of law, more nuanced about whether the conceptual binaries on which we rely actually apply in practice. For example, instead of describing the monetary system in terms of vertical and horizontal, we can talk about contracts. We can talk about, uh, instead of just defining public versus private, we can do what Bob was talking about and talk about franchises. Right? Even the person who wants to create a, a, a private credit contract between two people is relying implicitly on some form of law. And we know that because the difference, you know, if you try to 
call up a, a drug delivery, you know, a, a marijuana delivery company to your house and then they, they, they rob you, what are you going to do? Call someone and say, well, I, I, was, I, I, I paid him money. Can't you come and arrest him? You're going to get arrested. Right? So, so there is a difference, even at the local level, between what is legally sanctioned and what isn't, that isn't clearly definable in terms of the federal law. And to give one more example, there's a large fight that takes place today around central bank interests, essentially, which it should be. And this is framed as large part as a debate over democratic uh, uh, accountability or democratic responsibility. But in reality, it's, it's a debate over the, the realm of the administrative law. It's an administrative law conversation. There's, lo there's been a lot of legal ink spilled on that administrative law question. But you'd never notice that if you focused on the way that most economists talk about central bank independence as though it's a constitutional independence and sovereignty. If you, if you ask the lawyers, they will tell you that obviously this is just another kind of administrative law issue, and there are ways to analogize that. But the n again, the number of lawyers who are going to volunteer <laughs> to, to tell you that, uh, you can count them on one hand. Which brings me to my last point, which is this. It would be great if the lawyers could pick up the pieces of their analysis. It would be great if, and, and people like Bob are, are certainly doing their best to make that happen. But I fear, at least, the legal cavalry is going to so that's not your fault. <laughs> that's our fault. Right? <laughs> the monetary economists have been trying to get this message to us lawyers for years, going back to Innes public publishing his articles in the Banking Law Journal or Rummel giving his talk to the American Bar Association that taxes for revenue are obsolete. Right? We haven't been listening, and we're probably not going to continue to do so, at least not fast enough and at, at, a, at a good pace. So I'm sorry that we've let you guys down. I'm sorry on behalf of the law students for the fact that while this crisis has inspired a global movement among economics students, for example, the International Student Initiative for Pluralism and Economics, or the CPED, we remain paralyzed, even as our own career model and industry collapses on us. I'm sorry on behalf of legal practitioners for our apathy and blindness and timidity, um, and our failure to enforce the law when it comes to the systemic fraud that we were talking about yesterday, which if it didn't ex cause the crisis, certainly exacerbated it. And most of all, I'm sorry on behalf of the Legal Academy for leaving you guys alone to shoulder this burden uh, for that time of year. Because that's what it is. We're talking about time of year, right? We used to have a course in law school called Law and Economics, which is the whole Gary Becker, Richard Posner, and Friday neoliberal microeconomics-based approach to the law that underlies the kind of cost-benefit analysis we heard about earlier. So they used to have a particular course called Law and Economics, but they don't need to do that anymore because now it's everywhere. It's in every class. So it's just the water in which we swim. You don't need to have the course anymore. It's headquarters. Which is funny, but it's also kind of tragic. And I'll end just by saying that when Bob Prash, the, the late and dear Bob Prash, came to Columbia a few years ago for a seminar on the disparate impact of unemployment on racial, gender, and age minorities, he made a comment that stuck with me, which is that the economics department evolved out of time. So on behalf of the law students who are left behind and the lawyers who been operating without you guys for a while, uh, I'd like to say to you guys, please come back. Please. <laughs> like the ants with the ant wives, I don't know what we did to drive you away, <laughs> but whatever it was, we're sorry. We need you, and we miss you, and we want you to come back. Thanks. Thank you, Rowan. And the final uh, talk for, the, for this seminar is by Marco uh, Vangelisti, um, who is also a research fellow at the Gonzaga Institute, and he's the founder of Essential Knowledge for Transition, which is a curriculum for engaged citizens to understand the uh, money and banking system, the economic system, and the financial system, and how we need to transform them. Thank you. Well. Thank you very much. I don't know if you can uh, hear me, but I wanted to uh, thank the Bing Zagra Institute for inviting me here, uh, Rob Parenteau for providing an introduction, and you for inviting me to this event. Um, I think we're in trouble in this country because of ideological, narrow thinking. And so this institute and this conference in particular is an oasis of diversity of ideas and, and of views. And so my view will be diverse from some of the views presented here, but hopefully uh, of interest. 
Now, um, I started essential knowledge for transition about five, six years ago when I left the finance industry, when I realized the activists, the ones to change society for the better, had a very uh, scant understanding of the money and banking system, the economic system, and the financial system. I believe they act as an operating system of society and that we need to have people, regular folks, understand the systems and feel empowered to challenge their operation and their design and eventually change it through the political process. And so I see my role not so much as that of an expert, but of a translator. So what I do is I take what I know about the systems and express them in terms that are accessible to everybody uh, without using lingo or technical knowledge because I think that's the key to democracy. Now the challenge here and now is that I only have 20 minutes. I might have to use a little bit of lingo and expose some ideas uh, almost uh, uh, epigrammatically because we don't have a lot of time. So when a community invites me to uh, talk about money and banking, I make the following key points. See if I can see that the design of the money banking system itself is involved in a lot of the problems we face, like increasing level of debt, private and public. And I know not all the debt is bad, but nevertheless, it's an issue. Economic instability, uh, concentration of wealth, loss of democracy and government corruption, environmental and climate disruption. And even though, and we probably um, got a sense from the last two speakers, the banking, money, um, uh, the banking money system have become very complex in the last 30 years. If you just think about the use of derivatives, if you think about the financialization of banking, if you think about the emergence of uh, shadow banking. But nevertheless, understanding the key design features of the money and banking system uh, doesn't require specialized knowledge and, it is, and is accessible to all. And as I said, it's key to the democratic process. So what, uh, what are the key two points I make when I talk about the money banking system? That it is a private-public partnership where most of the risks have gravitated towards the public and most of the benefits towards the private sector. And the other thing is that banks' profit motive leads them to mis misuse their awesome power. What is their awesome power? Money creation and credit allocation. So, and that redesigning the money and banking system would allow us to tackle the big problems we have. So, you know, things like, uh, uh, I don't know, rebuild our infrastructure or improve the education system or improve healthcare and prevention or, you know, climate adaptation, environmental restoration, rebuilding local food system infrastructure, re repopulate rural areas and transition to organic agriculture. A lot of these projects need to be funded with capital that does not look for positive financial returns, okay? And so we need to get hold of how our money banking system is designed to make these things possible. So uh, as Professor Perry Merlin of the Barnard College said, uh, there are four patterns of thought that need to be overcome to understand the money system. The first one is that there is no free lunch. Actually, as uh, Newt Vixell noted, noted in uh, the late 1800s, when banks make loans, they create brand new purchasing power. Banks create the money they lend. And somebody said, you know, they book their assets, uh, as a, their assets, the promise of the borrower to repay, and they create a brand new checking account with that money. It's a swap of IOUs. So the banks accept the IOUs of the borrower, and they swap it for their own IOUs, a promise to repay or make payments. That's how electronic money is created is a creature of accounting. And there is theoretically no limit to how much you can expand the balance sheet of banks. The other one is that money is a positive number. Well, actually no, the money is a creature of accounting, which means it sits somewhere on a balance sheet. So it could be a positive or negative number depending on which balance sheet you're looking at and which type of money you're talking about. So. Uh, the bank deposits are liabilities of the bank, so a negative number there, but a positive number for us. It's an asset of the public sector, uh, the, the private sector, right? And this may be the hardest one for uh, some people in this crowd to overcome, which is this idea that money is a creature of the nation state. 
In order to stick to this, you have to conflate the Federal Reserve with the state, but one is a private entity and the other one operates for the public good. Uh, and that money is uniform. Well, it turns out that money is quite different. You think a dollar in your pocket is equal to a dollar in the bank? Uh, those two forms of money are qualitatively different. There are different money that sits on a different level of the money hierarchy. And a functioning banking system trades them at par and makes you believe that they are identical. But during financial crisis, you realize there is a difference between them. For example, the people in Cyprus in 2013 realized that their checking account with the Bank of Cyprus, the euros they had there, were worth about 50 cents to an actual euro when the bank confiscated parts of their deposits to recapitalize itself. So if you think about this very simple schematic, and here I'm back to the gold standard, you know, gold is no one's liability. It's an asset, used to be an asset of the central bank, and was the means of final payments between nations. But the central bank could issue the currency, the money we use. Uh, the currency is a liability of the central bank. It's an asset of the banking sector. The banks themselves could create uh, demand deposits for their customers. And, you know, the private sector used those deposits to uh, do their business. Now, you could also create your own kind of money. You need a bike, you don't have money on you, you write an IOU to your friend, you get your bike. That's kind of money. It facilitated a transaction, but you have at a certain point to come up with money you did not create. Either you give a $100 bill, which is money created by the central bank, or you write a check to your friend with money created by the banks. That is true up the hierarchy chain. Banks create the money that is used by their customers, but they do not create the money they need to settle their own accounts. For that, they need currency, or actually the electronic version of it, federal fund deposits. So that's very important to understand. But uh, let's just look at how much money private banks have created in the United States. This is the aggregate balance sheet of commercial banks in the United States uh, six weeks ago or so. And you see on the liability side, the demand deposits and the time deposits. Uh, this is electronic money, which is the liability of the banks, which are part of our money supply. That's what we use to make payments. So we consider this money. And it's part of either M1 or M2, depending on whether you look at uh, you know, time deposits or not. But uh, in general, let's say $11 trillion is the money that was created by the banks. How? By making loans. Remember, it's the swap of IOU. Half of the loans are still on the books of the banks, commercial loans, 1.9 trillion, real estate loans, 3.8, consumer loans, 1.2. Some of them got sold, repackaged, and came back as mortgage-backed securities and CDOs. But it's important to understand that every dollar that is either a demand deposit or a time deposit originated at one point with a loan by a bank, okay? So now the question is, what are the good functions of banking? Sorry, I, I was not at your talk, but I think you pointed out. Uh, underwriting, right? So whose liability to monetize, right? Who are we giving this, this money to when uh, people are asking to, to borrow money from the bank? So underwriting services is one. Uh, the other one is obviously having the banking sector create money through this process increases the elasticity of the money supply. So you could say that's positive. But at the end of the day, the key function of the banking sector, and then we'll go into the problems, but the, the key function is maturity, liquidity, and credit transformation. Now this uh, seems a little bit technical, but let me explain very simply. Uh, uh, enterprise goes to a bank, gets a $1 million five-year loan, okay? Now, the process is that is booked as an asset of the bank. The bank creates money for it, you know, uh, credits a million dollar in the checking account of this firm. Effectively, they have transformed an illiquid five-year, $1 million uh, instrument with the credit risk of the borrower into a perfectly liquid, in fact, it is money, zero maturity, right? It's demand deposits. Uh, amount 
of one million now with the credit of the bank. And, and the credit of the bank is basically supported by the equity capital of the bank, by the diversified set of, uh, of assets of the bank, and by the FDIC insurance. So this idea of credit maturity and liquidity transformation is a positive function of the banking sector that the proponents of 100% reserve banking, for example, uh, early Milton Friedman, by the way, uh, Irwin Fisher at the time, Positive Money Institute, America, uh, American Monetary Institute, uh, are missing. I mean, there is a good function about that. We'll go into the problems in, in a second. This is the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. The Federal Fund deposits are basically reserves of the banking sector. Before the financial crisis, that number, it's now $2,550 billion. It used to be $50 billion. So that's all the reserves that were needed in the banking sector before the financial crisis. Some really goofy stuff happened since then, and I don't have the time to get into that. But I want to say at this point only two things about the Federal Reserve. One is that um, it has never, at least in the last couple of decades, controlled the overall amount of money created by the banking sector. And somebody pointed out already why. Because they targeted the federal funds rate, which meant a policy of infinite liquidity in reserves. Federal Reserve has, has stood ready to provide whatever liquidity, whatever reserves was needed for the banking sector to maintain that federal fund rate. The second thing I'm going to say about the Federal Reserve, some people are saying, let's abolish it. And what we need to understand is that if you have a money system built with a superstructure of bank credit, which sits on top of whatever monetary base you have, whether it's gold or whether it's fiat currency issued by the central bank, you need an ultimate provider of liquidity to support the liquidity and maturity transformation of the banks. So you need a provider of ultimate liquidity. But having said that, let's go into the problems of the current system. And again, up to here would be an hour talk, but you know, uh, you, you're safe. <laughs> so what's wrong with the system? that basically all money is created uh, as debt. And if you think about it, here's the picture. Uh, the US Treasury, which is the government, does create some money. That is the metal coins in your pockets, about $40 billion of metal coins. There are not a liability of the government is debt-free uh, money that is the asset of the bearer, and it's not anyone's liability, but it's tiny. The Federal Reserve, you could argue, uh, we've seen the balance sheet, has created about $4,000 billion worth of money, of which two and a half in the reserves used by the banks to pay each other, and one and a half trillion in paper currency. By the way, half of that is circulating outside the United States. And $11 trillion is the money created by the private banking sector. We have a private money system in this country at this point, as far as I can tell. Uh, the other problem is, and maybe even bigger uh, than the first one, is that no money is created to repay the interest on that debt. So if you think about the $11 trillion of money that is issued by the banking sector when they make loans, they only create the principal of that loan. No one within the banking sector creates the interest, the money to pay the interest. This has a number of consequences. One is it forces us on a continuous growth in the monetary uh, system because we need to borrow next year more to cover the principal and the interest for which no money was created last year. This forces also the economy on a continuous growth path, right? And so the environmental destruction is almost uh, written into the uh, money banking system as it is designed right now. The other one, and again, this is the idea that uh, the private banking sector now has effectively the monopoly of money creation. Yes, the government can issue bonds. That is not money because you don't see it in any money supply aggregate. I mean, uh, it's, it's bonds, and I don't have a problem with the, the idea that um, uh, the government is not constrained in the amount of bond that it, it can issue, but it remains the fact that money creation, which I think is a fundamental uh, government function, has been privatized. And uh, um, 
I, so if you, another way of looking at this is, is if all the money we use, or 92% of that, is created by the banking se sector when they make loans, it means we are collectively borrowing our own money supply. And we have to pay rent, which in the form of interest every year. This is a tax on the productive economy that transfers wealth from, from the economy as a whole, from the community as a whole, to the very few, the people that have already capital to lend out, or the banking sector that can create that money by lending. So the mathematical consequence of that is an increase in wealth inequality. Again, design into the system at this point, and the profit motive leads to inappropriate money creation and allocation. So the banks not only create the money when they're lending it, but they also decide the first use of that money by putting it in a particular sector. This is data from the Financial Stability Authority in England, put together in this chart by the Positive Money Institute. They looked at money creation by UK banks in the 10 years prior, prior to the financial crisis. They found that 40% of the money created by the banks was lent into real estate. Guess what? Home prices went up 300% in that period of time. 37% uh, was lent into financial speculation. Stock markets and bond markets have gone up a lot those, uh, over those 10 years. 10% credit cards and personal loans, and only 13% went to non-financial businesses. And this in part has to do with the Basel, you know, capital risk uh, weighting and so on. But the bottom line is the allocation of credit is not optimal for society. If, money create bank, if banks create money and it's directed into the productive economy, more goods and services will be created that can absorb that extra money and not cause necessarily inflation. But you're, if you're creating a lot of money and put it into, for example, buying and selling the same stock of housing, guess what? You have uh, housing inflation. Or if you go and buy and sell this number of, of shares on the stock market, you're going to boost up the value of the stock market. So. Uh, and the final point, and this might be uh, controversial, but I actually believe that the debt-based money system is in the process of collapsing. And you're seeing the first signs in countries that not, do not control their uh, monetary lever, like, for example, uh, Greece and Spain and so on, or the countries that uh, uh, are using someone else's currency, like uh, Puerto Rico, for example. But at the end of the day, if you have a global system built on bank-generated credit that never creates the money to pay for the interest that that credit uh, originates, then eventually, notwithstanding the temporary palliative of central banks absorbing extra debt into their books, is a global Japan-style uh, balance sheet recession. And there is a way out of that and it requires to be a little bit creative. So first of all, let me look at the private-public um, divide. Right now we have basically a private banking sector and mostly a private Federal Reserve. We can go into the discussion in the Q&A, but you know, uh, that's touted as one of the advantages of having a private central bank, because independent of pressure by the government, actually that feature makes it, in my view, uh, a very easy prey of regulatory capture. And in fact, the legal scholars in the House can maybe provide another example, but it seems to me that is a prime example of unconstitutional private delegation. Congress is not supposed to pass on regulatory rulemaking, lawmaking to a private entity. So my recommendation, of course, would be to nationalize the Federal Reserve do what uh, the UK did to the Bank of England in 1946. And then we would be a little bit closer to the MMT idea of a closer connection between uh, the US Treasury and the Federal Reserve. And in terms of debt-free and debt-based, to resolve the issue with uh, more interests and more debt out there than money to repay, really, which is uh, intrinsic in the way most of the money is generated right now, it's created. Uh, what we need to do is to expand the debt-free money issued by the US Treasury. This is basically the TAN proposal of Rob Parenteau. This is the greenbacks in the, the 1860s 
this one is what uh, Lord Adair Turner calls uh, overt permanent money financing. This is what Ben Bernanke really meant at the beginning when he talked about the helicopter money uh, dumped on Japan that was dealing with deflation. And as long as you have money created debt-free by the government that is injected directly into the income stream of the economy, none of that uh, you know, fancy indirect way of stimulating the economy as we've seen uh, this morning, then you can really get out of a global uh, uh, recession, global deflation, which is the natural course of action, I think, for the system as it is designed right now. Now, what should we do with the banking sector? You can see here, I'm kind of giving away a little bit, uh, oops, you see the banking sector moving a little bit towards the public? I'm suggesting that uh, there that some banks need to be public banks, and uh, we'll hear from uh, Ellen tonight. But right now, here is how the banking sector looks like. The top four banks, they're too big to fail, too big to jail, in my view, too big to exist. Uh, control half of the banking assets in the United States and half of the deposits in the United States. They represent a systemic risk that from an insurance standpoint is undiversifiable. One way to reduce them is to basically say, do you want to be part of the FDIC? Well, your assessment, your premium for being part of it should be 10 times or 100 times greater than the rest of the banks because your risk is undiversifiable. Uh, another way of doing that is basically have capital requirements and um, reserve requirements that are a function of the size of the bank so that it would be uneconomical for the large banks not to break themselves up in smaller banks. And I think that's where we need to go. We need to go to a place where no uh, individual private bank is more than 1% or 2% of the whole assets, you know, depositors base of, of the United States. This will still be a bank in the hundred of billion dollars in assets. So we're not talking about little, you know, it's, it's definitely a large bank, but it's not, you know, systemically uh, risky for the whole economy. One could actually go without shaking the whole thing up. We need uh, new public banks, and I like the idea of a reconstruction finance corporation, you know, 2.0, that could uh, issue bond that the Federal Reserve could buy that would finance a maybe a uh, um, uh, federal employment program to rebuild our infrastructure. Uh, and, you know, this existed for about 20, 25 years in the United States, I guess from the 30s to the 50s, was a public bank that financed the reconstruction of this country. So what if money creation and credit allocation was directed to the common good? Basically, the U.S. Treasury could uh, issue debt-free money, put it, inject uh, it directly in the income stream, and funding basic social needs. Uh, the quantity needs to be sufficient to cover the legacy interest for which no money was crea uh, created by the private sector. The Federal Reserve, and this we haven't explored yet, but I think it's, it's an interesting, maybe I'll, I'll write something about it. Um, the Federal Reserve, we could use the, the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve to uh, fund the natural commons. Uh, the entire uh, value of um, farmland in the United States is $2.4 trillion, which is less than the expansion in the balance sheet in the last of, of the Federal Reserve in the last five years, which means that as the old farmers retire, we could have the Federal Reserve buy that land and then lease it to young farmers to do organic farming and keep that in uh, for as a common for uh, this uh, nation forever without taking it out of the financial speculation of uh, international uh, money looking for a safe place to land. Uh, of course, funding infrastructure project and supporting the small and medium enterprise lending. This was actually the original design of the Federal Reserve in 1913. If you look at it, it basically to rediscount commercial loans. And so the idea of supporting small and medium um, enterprise lending. And the banks uh, should be the credit that the banks, if they're not public banks, then if they're private banks, they their uh, credit creation should be directed. The allocation of credit should be directed in the places that don't create financial bubbles, that don't create real estate speculation, and fund instead productive economic activities. 
So um, at that point, we can finally tackle all the things we need to do. Uh, the time is now, and I think the conversation in this room uh, are uh, pointing at the right direction. So the last, uh, uh, the last quote here is, if governments do not shape money, they are shaped by it. Uh, and the idea here is that the, there is a lot of mistrust of government. That is because we have a very corrupt government right now, and we have to face that. And so it is really upon us not only to uh, demand these changes, but also demand that the state that would then have, or the government that would have all that power, including uh, money issuance and mon money creation, is operating for the interest of the collectivity and not just the interest of the moneyed elite and the few. So, thank you very much. <laughs> Do we sit down or? Okay. Okay, all right. So, if uh, the panelists would please join me. Okay, questions from the audience? Thank you very much. Um, I have a question about, uh, uh, I was wondering if you can shed some light on, uh, on repo, and the, uh, uh, the repo and uh, reverse repo uh, from, from, uh, from the point of view of the Fed as a uh, macro prudential tool and then what it would look like to the rest of the economy. So the question was about um, maybe the possible use of repo and reverse repo as a macro prudential tool. Um, you know, I think there's n there's nothing about repo. Uh, repo is basically just one particular sort of transaction technology, right? And you could put it to any number of, of, of uses, but it's essentially a kind of short-term collateralized uh, borrowing, right? Um, and when it comes to macro prudential regulation, um, the way the Fed would do that, I think, um, it's nice that they're actually acknowledging the prospect of doing that now. Um, I think that sort of deciding to do that is sort of, n sort of neutral with respect to the tools that you use. I mean, speaking sort of most generically, I think the easiest way for the Fed to act in a, in a real proactive way, macro prudentially, is to recognize that open market operations ought to be conducted in more than just treasury securities. And they ought to be conducted with a view not merely to controlling consumer price inflation, uh, but to controlling other forms of inflation as well, right? Um, the mandate that the Fed has under the Federal Reserve Act is to maintain price stability. There's no reference to consumer prices. There's no reference to any particular kind of price. It's just to prices, right? So one, one way of looking at the, that the errors that the Fed committed in the late 1990s and early 2000s is by saying that, look, it looked at the wrong prices, right? It, it had to look at consumer prices. It noted that there wasn't any significant inflation in consumer prices, and so it concluded that everything is hunky-dory. Meanwhile, it's ignoring not merely a price inflation, but a price hyperinflation in other markets, in particular markets for financial assets, especially MBS. So one way to look at the macroprudential task, I think, is by saying, all right, the Fed ought to be engaging in a more variegated set of open market operations. OMO should actually be O various O's, right? So there should be open market uh, asset operations. There should be open market maybe labor operations. You could view the ELR idea as essentially a form of open market labor operations. And all of these would be justified by reference to the same basic idea, that is maintaining a certain kind of price stability in a particular kind of market. So now you'd be looking at commodity prices, you'd be looking at consumer prices as measured by the CPI, you'd be looking at labor prices. Anything that you decided was an important policy variable would be something whose price you would be viewing as, in effect, systemically significant, right? So I, I've actually recently been re, um, writing something called Systemically Significant Prices, or SIPIs, that basically the Fed ought to be targeting all sorts of SIPIs and then maintaining stability within the particular markets where those prices are offered. 
Um, then when it comes to repo, well, repo is simply one particularly fine-grained way of engaging in open market operations, but it doesn't have anything, it, 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 it's again, it's kind of neutral as between what prices you're targeting. You could use it in, in open market operations with respect to any set of prices, whether they were, again, consumer prices, asset prices, labor prices, or, or, or what have you. Um, and the Fed already does that, right? The Fed uses repo in conducting its ordinary, traditional open market operations even, even today, right? So um, I don't know that, you know, that the, 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 the Fed's capacity to use repo sort of settles any particular question as to sort of what it ought to be using repo for. I, I think it would simply, again, use it as one way in which to conduct open market operations. Um, but then as far as macroprudential regulation goes, the real key is to sort of broaden the range of prices that are viewed as being salient, right, as, as being worthy of intervening in connection with. Is, is that more or less responsive? Can I add something? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so one thing, and, and maybe this is a different answer to a different question, mm -hmm. but um, Bob's talk about this idea that shadow banks are intrinsically connected to the licensed banking system in terms of connected to the state. It seemed to me that with the, with the, with the introduction of reverse repo and things like that, one of the things that they're trying to do from a macro prudential perspective is to be able to regulate those other sort of shadow banking institutions as though they were on the same plane as banks and giving them access to the same kinds of free service without actually having the messy conversation of redefining the kinds of institutions they want to consider to be systemically, uh, you know, part of the public sector or, or at that first tier, you know, rather than a separate or third right. level. So, so it seems like the reverse repo is a is an attempt to sort of avoid having a more <coughs> messy or perhaps frank discussion. Right. And actually, the the funny thing uh, I mentioned that uh, uh, you need. Uh, ultimate provider of liquidity when the banks are doing uh, maturity, liquidity, and credit transformation. Well, the shadow banking has been doing maturity, liquidity, and credit transformation without federal deposit insurance enhancements, nor access directly to the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve had to step in once that fell into the regular banking system and then the Fed had to take it on. So it's just a, you know, that, that function needs to be understood as you know, um, uh, an important one. Well, I, I'd like to extend build on that with, with respect to uh, the idea that we can sort of change how banking works because it seems to me, and this is seems to me an interesting question, correct me if I'm mischaracterizing it, but if you start with respect to the every entity as a bank, then the kind of credit and maturity transformation that's going on happens with all kinds of institutions to some degree. Now the question is how much legal protection you want to give them, how important do we want to let them become, what kind of things we <coughs> want to do, but the idea of eliminating uh, those kinds of practices from anybody except a certain elite group or even everybody in charge, um, in the same way to me as the idea of eliminating debt-based money doesn't make sense because it's contracts we're talking about. Contracts are liquidity and credit transformation to some degree. If you go to a, a local pub and get a, a bar tab, there's a level of credit and maturity transformation. So unless you're talking about making it illegal to engage in contract formation, I don't know how you get to debt-free money. Um, and I don't know what a contract I mean, we, is if not a debt. Well, we, we, we've done it before, right? I mean, uh, you, the coins are debt-free money. No, 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 but we haven't gotten an entire monetary system without debt. There was coins. No, 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 I, I agree. No, I agree with you. It's like the, uh, that's the, the point I was making is that the good part about banking is that it provides uh, le um, elasticity in the money supply through credit creation, right, does underwriting and does the maturity transformation. So uh, that part has to be associated with the credit created by the banks, therefore the, the borrowing and the lending that occurs. <coughs> so I'm not calling for 100% uh, debt-free money system, you basically uh, would have to give up on the, um, the maturity and liquidity transformation and you have to give up on the flexibility and elasticity of the money supply. So uh, the only argument I'm making is that there should be enough uh, debt-free money created to repay the interest that is the outcome of the um, extension of credit by the banks. So it would, I mean, I'm not, I don't, I believe it's others here to talk about the, the interest rate question. Uh, interest, but, but it seems to me that the state debt is still a contract. It's still debt. Even money is a debt. I mean, when you when you create a contract or an obligation to somebody else legally, that's a debt. So right. the state is obligating itself when it creates any form of debt. So I'm, I'm still trying to understand. I mean, it is a no, Not necessarily. So, I mean, uh, the, the fact that most of our money is created as debt and it is someone's obligation is a, uh, if, you want, if, if, you, if you want, if you want, is a necessary, but uh, it's, it's a, um, sufficient but not necessary condition to a certain extent. In other words, not all money or all that function as money needs to be someone else's IOU. 
The example is gold is no one's IOU and function. Once, so it, once a king I stands his head on gold, it's an IOU. Until then, it's just a commodity. Well, I, think I mean, guys maybe you guys, I mean, one of the, your, your, your own is, is thinking in terms of liabilities, and I think you might be suggesting that there's a category of debt that is distinct from a broader category of liabilities. Is that the idea? Uh, I'm, I'm just saying uh, the, um, the greenbacks, for example, were issued by the U.S. Treasury to pay for war goods, was accepted in payment of taxes, but it and was not more than a liability than unless you say mm -hmm. that accepting it in payment of taxes is itself a liability. But I think that's what Ron is saying. Right? That, that's, that's, what your distinct, what, that's where your difference lies. I think Ron is saying, look, as long as it's a liability, it's a debt in a sense, right? And th when the government commits to accept it in payment of taxes, it's taking on a liability in that sense. And in that sense, it's taking on a debt. Right, but but you're but trying to distinguish th between that form of liability and other forms of liability. Well, you know, right. but th there was not federal income tax at the time. Yep. Right. Uh, so uh, I mean, uh, if there were fees and fines and right. tariffs. Right. And I think, yeah, we should probably move on. Sorry, sorry. All right. We'll talk about it later. So on the, what was it, the, the, the legacy interest? Uh -huh. So several problems with that. First off, Steve Keen has shown that that's not true, basic velocity issue. Second problem with it is you make the assumption that there's nothing else going on. Banks are still paying their workers. Banks are still paying dividends. Banks are still paying taxes. So that amount of legacy you're talking about is tiny. Okay. S uh, thirdly, um, the whole argument falls once you recognize that the federal government's national debt is net worth to the private sector. And so the legacy is $10 trillion that's already out there in national debt. Debt-free money uh, in terms of the government's debt and not selling bonds, you have to have ZERP forever for that to work because you, you, have create, you have to have zer zero interest rates forever for that to work, which actually I'm in favor of. But okay. Um, basic, simple supply and demand. If you oversupply the banking system with reserves, price falls to zero unless you have a price support, which is interest on reserves. So you have to actually be arguing for ZERP forever if you want the debt-free money, or uh, what you call debt-free money. So, okay. can pay by issuing more of their own liabilities. So you think it's debt-free well, money, but yeah. it is an IOU that's issued by one entity that is the government is liable for accepting it back. That's what they're liable on. So, so the, it's the, the difference is what you're liable for. What do you deliver? So the state problem. delivers acceptance. It delivers the contract behind it, where the private sector has to deliver somebody else's IOU, a bank IOU or a state IOU, to settle their debt obligations. Right. If you think about it in real terms, what the state is, the debt is, if you had a limited amount of political power, right? So you could only exercise so much taxes before there's a revolution. Now, if I've got a bunch of money and you want my car, you're going to have to issue a lot of taxes to get my car, right? Or get, get me to sell my car. So what tax, what money does as a liability of the government is, it's like a get out of jail free card. It's a get out of tax free card, right? This is what, this is what Rob was talking about, tax anticipation. So it gives you a real buffer in real economic terms against the power of the state to use its nominal tax power to take real risks. That's the liability of the state. The state uses up its scarce political capital in taxing when you have more money. I if you burn through your money, the state hasn't got your car until you run out, then you have to sell your car. That's the liability. Yeah, and I take it that your focus is simply what you want to say. When you say debt-free money, you mean money that is still a liability, but isn't a liability in the particular sense of that. You're trying to say that debt is... Well, so I mean, the, the tax... The tax and Anticipation notes, right? They have a zero interest attached to them. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I think it's, it's basically the same thing you're saying. Oh, oh I actually, I do have a question this time. I was wondering if uh, <laughs> you mentioned this, Marco, if the legal scholars could 
that's the word I'm looking speak for. To the, speak uh, to the, 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 the central uh, bank issue and private. Central bank as available. a private uh, delegation. So this is actually a, a, a kind of a common misconception, I, I think, about, about the Fed, right? So the Fed is a kind of, it's, it, the full name, of course, is the Federal Reserve System. Uh, and so it comprises a number of sort of subparts. At the very apex of the Federal Reserve System is the Federal Reserve Board. That's an entirely public entity. That's a regulatory entity. So essentially what's being delegated is regulatory power to the Federal Reserve Board, which is a typical delegation from Congress to a federal agency. The old non-delegation doctrine, there used to be a doctrine to the effect that Congress couldn't delegate certain legislative-like functions or executive-like functions to executive agents or to particular uh, federal agencies. That was settled during the time of the New Deal. It was thought, it, it was ultimately decided by the courts, you can't have a coherent, well-functioning administrative state such as we need during the New Deal era if you maintain the old non-delegation doctrine. So we have to allow a certain amount of delegation, at least to federal agencies, provided that they comply with certain restrictions that we place on them through the so-called Administrative Procedure Act of 1946. So the Federal Reserve Board is an entirely governmental entity, uh, and it is delegated authority by Congress, and that's entirely legit under the sort of legal settlement that we reached during the New Deal era. On the other hand, you do have the various federal, uh, regional Federal Reserve banks, banks, right? The New York Fed, the Cleveland Fed, so on and so forth. Those are kind of mixed public-private entities in the sense that their particular governing boards are chosen partly by the Federal Reserve Board, which is entirely, again, government agency, but then also partly elected by private banking interests as well. And in that sense, the, the regional Federal Reserve banks are sort of hybrid entities. If those regional Fed banks were themselves crafting regulations, there might well be a delegation problem. But as it is, all of the regs are promulgated by the Federal Reserve Board, which is, a, again, at the apex of the system, and that is entirely and unambiguously a, a federal agency. But the, the Open Market Committee, isn't that made up uh, majority by the, uh, the, um, the federal uh, presidents of the regular Federal Reserve? Yeah, there have, there are actually, some people do worry, uh, some people have argued that the FOMC's decisions might be some kind of a violation of the non-delegation doctrine, particularly given the outsized role that the president of the New York Fed has in, you know, as uh, in that committee, right, as a member of that committee. Um, in a way, I mean, ironically, if the chair, if the Federal Reserve Board chair, or if just the board itself were as, say, monopolistically all-powerful on the FOMC as some people have sometimes suggested that it is, ironically, you would have less of a delegation problem, right, because it, this would be an entirely governmental function. But insofar as a regional Federal Reserve Bank head is also part of the committee, and indeed, as insofar as five are, you've, you, you do have the potential for some kind of an argument to the effect that, well, there's a delegation problem here. But the difficulty is it's, 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 it's not unambiguous, right, precisely because you do have federal regulatory uh, uh, folk on the FOMC as well. And the question is, you know, is their role prominent or prim primary? And it seems to be. So. I mean, another way to say that is it's a badly designed public agency that has some level of institutional capture. Right? Now, if you put people on the FDA from the, the, the pharma industries and it started making decisions that were pro-pharma, you would probably look to the fact that you were elected people from the pharma industry. You wouldn't say the FDA is private. You would say there's private people making decisions in places where it could be actually of public interest. And the person I think who's doing the research now is Peter Conti. I think it's Peter. Peter Conti Brown over at Stanford Law School. He's doing a big legal research project on the uh, all the various legal issues around the leadership structure of the Fed and the extent to which the, the, the current structure um, you know, affects and I, uh, the um, it affects its, its level of corruption. He's the other person is um, Peter's actually at Wharton now. Oh, he's he's at in Wharton. that legal studies department, and he's got a book coming out in February of 2016. It's called, I think, The Supreme Court of Finance, and it's about the Fed. And it's, it's an attempt at a sort of a, a full legal analysis of, of, of the Fed. One other thing that's worth pointing out here is that the Federal Reserve System as we have it is the product, it's messy because it's the product of a very difficult settlement that was arrived at in 1913, right? We unfortunately in America do have this kind of longstanding traditional suspicion of the very idea of a central bank. The apotheosis of that view, of course, was found in, in, in Andrew Jackson's veto of the renewal of the, of the Second Bank of the United States. It took a long time to get us ever even to get a central bank, and when we finally got one in 1913, the only way to get it was to make these various compromises with private banking interests. And some people would argue, and I think I would count myself among them, that the system maybe ought to be looked at again now, now that we've come along 100 years down the road, 
where there's less controversy about the very idea of a central bank. We might not have to make the same compromises now that we apparently had to make in 1913 in order to get one. And I think that the, the appropriate uh, way to do it now would be essentially to make it altogether public, to make it entirely right. un unambiguously public rather than kind of squishy, part public, part private, as it is now. Right. And Tim Canova, who's also a law professor, has been making this point for a while, that, 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 that an area of political action should be the way in which we collect portraits. But I think, you know, to avoid, uh, you know, in a similar way I was talking about sort of accusations of crude, you know, being overly reductive or, or being legally inconsistent, what we're talking about there is changing the legal system. Right. We're not talking about nationalizing a bunch of legal systems and putting them into the public law. We're talking about changing the, the legal system. And correct me if I'm right on legal history, but with regards to what you're saying about the member banks versus the FOMC, there was also a political fight there about yeah. control, and that happened, I guess, in the 30s, maybe I'm wrong. But that there was a point at which there was a wrestling of control away from the regional leaders towards the FOMC, and that was generally considered, you know, the turning point at, at which the, the board became an agency of the executive mm -hmm. rather than an agency of, um, of private banks. And, there, it, and it took till the 50s for the executive to lose power over it again. That's, like yeah, that's exactly right. And of course, there was also a long-standing struggle between Treasury and the Fed as to who had primacy um, and whether uh, the Fed was entirely independent of Treasury or not. And that, too, was sort of settled in the 1950s. At least the current settlement was reached in the 1950s. Uh, well, the, the Treasury Fed Accord. The, the Confida, yeah, yeah, yeah right. exactly. And that's a similar fight that you see a lot of administrative agencies around. All the time. Yeah. Final point, maybe on this point, is a one interesting proposal that's been kind of floating out there for a while, and Liz Warren is probably the primary name associated with it now, is that maybe at least the president of the New York Fed ought to be uh, a, a, you know, a, an appointee of the president who ought to be confirmed by the Congress. Because at the very least, that regional Fed bank president does have this, again, this kind of outsized role. He's effectively a public official, and yet he's not, strictly speaking, one legally because, again, the New York Fed is kind of half private, half public institution. Yeah, they're responsible for doing open market operations. They're responsible for managing the Treasury General account. They're sort of the... Every single day, their trading desk is conducting the, o the OMO. The first one is, we've talked about it, interest rates have been low since around 08, I believe, and they have remained low. Uh, what <coughs> recommendations would you guys have for families in terms of investment? What can they do and what would be the best investment for them to be able to take advantage of, advantage of these interest rates to get out of poverty or is there any link between the two? The second question is about student loans. Um, it's a huge crisis. and. Um, we hear about student loans being a huge problem, but we don't really hear about solutions. So what I'm asking the big finance guys and the lawyers is what, is there anything that can be done or I are there any kind of investment that families can make or government could do to help children, to help kids go to school without having to incur billions of dollars in debt? Thank you. Maybe a quick thing, I, I, I'm, I'll start maybe. Then. So on the second one first, uh, on student loan, Hello. So on, the, on, the, on student loans, uh, I'm going to go back to something that Randy said last night, actually. Um, it's completely preposterous. It's entirely absurd that we have federally guaranteed loans that are privately extended right, by private banking institutions, which then charge high rents, right, money rental rates on those loans when they're guaranteed. The thing is, we didn't used to do it that way. The loans used to be directly federally supplied in exactly the way that Randy was recommending last night. If we're going to guarantee them, if, we're gonna, if, if we as the public are going to bear the risk, then we as a public ought to be the ones earning the so-called interest. And indeed, as Randy suggested last night, there's no reason to charge high interest anyway. And indeed, we even should be prepared to eat the loss from time to time because this isn't really about profit maximization. But of course, as you know, right, rent-seeking private banking institutions have a real gift for securing federal guarantees of various sorts so that all the risk is indeed socially borne or socialized while all of the potential for upside gain is privately captured. This is a classic case of a public resource with a private rent attached. And indeed, the banking system as a whole, as I was just describing it earlier today, that's another case. Public resource, private rent. The public resource is the full faith and credit of the United States. The private rent is the interest and all of the other fees that the banks are charging. Those fees are privatized seniorage. They're only justified if the private members of the partnership are actually adding value. I would submit that by and large, they're taking away much more value than they're adding. So I would say 
fully federalize again, fully socialize as we used to do under the federal guaranteed student loan program, but also more directly under the federally supplied uh, the Pell Grant loan system, we should just return to that altogether. On your first question about what, where to invest in this low interest rate environment, I would actually suggest that you start with Mr. Herman, <laughs> who was talking to us over lunch. I think that's probably the route to go. There's some yield there, and again, in the, in the current environment, any yield is pretty is looking pretty good, and it's a socially responsible way to, to, to go. So I would say hip invest it would be my first uh, uh, piece of, uh, of, of advice. Um, so on the student debt issue, I came from a country where my parents went to university for free. <laughs> so there are different models of doing this that don't even just have to be within the context of student debt. Um, I paid what they call, not student debt, but a student contribution. And when I paid it in Australia, uh, you if you paid upfront, you got a discount. And if you paid later, you, you didn't. So there was a sort of interest embedded in there. And they got rid of that because they thought it prioritized people actually who had the money to pay upfront. They thought it was actually socially inequitable. They call that a student contribution because it's not framed as paying for college. It's framed as uh, an acknowledgement that you're getting access to a, a, a kind of social but good that only a limited proportion of the population currently get. And it, but it doesn't kick in until you earn over $45,000 a year. If you don't earn over $45,000 a year, you don't pay any tax. If you earn over $45,000, it kicks in as a slightly higher marginal tax rate. And to me, that, makes, that sounds <laughs> fair because what you're saying is, uh, we've promised you a social contract, go to university, have a higher standard of income and living, and if it doesn't materialize, then you, you don't have to pay, right? So that seems to be a pretty fair social contract on that front. But more generally, if we're talking about real resources, if we're talking about sustainability, which is the context of this conference, um, there's got to be a point where we reach a standard of material living where we can just say, there was the time when we only paid for people to go to good schools who were 12, then we paid for them to go to 18, now let's make it 22. I mean, the brain research is pretty clear that people's brains are still developing until the mid to late 20s. So I don't see why in 2600, when we're, when we're walking around you know, with replicators and Star Trek kind of stuff, that we still think that, that 18 is the amount to, to make a living. It doesn't seem to make sense to me, but maybe I'm just a big you know, no, child and want to go I back to I think that's right. You <laughs> often hear this expression like 50 is the new 30. Why isn't the BA right, the new high school diploma? Or why isn't the MA the new high school diploma if 50 is the new 30? You know, that, that's what I, when I was thinking, uh, talking at the beginning about the uh, ideological uniformity of thinking, uh, it's now all a private enterprise. You know, uh, is it worth to invest in your college education, right? So you have to come up with the money to invest, and then if the investment goes well, you can repay, otherwise you're, you're chained to your debt for the rest of your life. I mean, it's like, why do we have to think about everything has to be, um, uh, you know, done within the realm of the free market. I mean, I uh, studied in, uh, in college in Italy. I paid $500 uh, a year. Uh, and uh, my brethren up in, uh, in Denmark are even more uh, lucky than I was because the government would even give them a 700 euro stipend every month to cover their expenses. Why don't we think at, as educating our uh, workforce as a social investment that we can make socially without settling people into debt. So, I mean, that's, uh, again, the idea is, you know, this, this mentality that everything is a business, you know, and every decision has to be a business decision. Can I just make one point about your earlier question about wealth? I'm, um, I totally agree with a zero interest rate policy in general as a social issue. Um, I, I, I think that, you know, what the, the debt-free money movement is really talking about is, A, simplifying the operation of public finance, making it obvious how you spend money, and B, keeping it cheap. Now, there is a lot of pressure even from progressive unions to raise interest rates because you've got pension funds and other people who, you know, regular working class people's assets are, are, are getting squeezed as a result, to which I would say we need to fight in the streets on this one, right? Like, we need to change the way that we give people savings accounts and we need to change the way that we do superannuation. And going back to higher interest rates is really the way. Uh, for their contributions, and uh, we're going to go into a short break, but I'd like to also uh, thank the IT team. The uh, live stream is quite popular, and we are trending on Twitter, so thank you very much for your behind-the-scenes work. Uh, we will be back in 10 uh, minutes, uh, 15 minutes, uh, for the roundtable discussion. Thank you. <laughs>